In this tutorial, I'm going to teach you how to scan color transparencies using ViewScan and a film scanner. I did a tutorial for this five or six years ago, but I'm updating it now with a new version because ViewScan in the intervening years since I did the previous one has changed quite a bit. Some of the controls do different things than they did before, and some of them are in different locations in the interface. And so this one should be a lot easier for people who are using the current version of the software. Um, I'm using ViewScan 9.8.14, which is the current version of the software as of August 9th, 2023, which is the date that I'm making this tutorial. So let's go ahead and dive into it. Um, we're going to start out in the Input tab up here. Um, options should be set to Professional. The task should be set to Scan to File. Source is going to be the scanner that you're using. If you have more than one scanner attached to your computer, you'll, you'll be able to choose from a list of scanners. Um, I only have one attached right now, my Nikon LS50, which is also known as the CoolScan 5, and so it's showing by default. Um, media, you can choose um, different things here. You can choose, um, obviously, color negative film and black and white negative are not what we're going to use here since we're doing a color slide. Um, so that leaves the choice of either image or slide film. In earlier versions of ViewScan, uh, the instructions for the software said that the image choice gave a different rendering than the slide film choice. Um, I have found that that's not true with the current version of ViewScan, so it doesn't really matter which of these that you choose. I would choose slide film though because there are some options under the color tab that we'll get to in a couple minutes that are not available if you choose image as your media. So we're going to choose slide film for this. Um, preview area should be auto. Bits per pixel needs to be 48-bit RGB. 48-bit um, RGB, if you open these files in Photoshop, it's going to tell you they're a 16-bit file. And the reason is because 48-bit is 16 bits per channel. There's three color channels in a color uh, image, red, blue, and green. So 48 times, or 16 times 3 is 48. So you, do, you want to use a 48-bit file because if you did a 24-bit RGB, which Photoshop calls 8-bit per channel, you have, um, if you do very much editing to the file, if it needs a lot of color correction or contrast correction, an 8-bit file will start to fall apart. You'll get color banding and other artifacts. So it's always better to use the 48-bit option. Uh, it does make the file sizes larger, but it's, it's worth it, though, for the image quality. So make sure you choose that. Um, scan from preview should be turned off. Preview resolution should be set to auto. Scan resolution. I have this set to 4000 dpi, and the reason I've chosen that is because my Nikon scanner's maximum hardware resolution is 4000 dots per inch. You should set this to whatever the maximum is for your scanner. If you're using uh, the same scanner I'm using, use 4000. If you're using, um, I know Minolta made a scanner that was capable of 5400 dpi, one of the, one of their high-end 35 millimeter scanners could. I think some of their other, some of the lower end Minolta's did, I think, 2700 or 2800. Um, what, whatever it is that your scanner's maximum is, set that. The reason I'm recommending that is because there are people who will say, well, I don't want to make a big print. I'm just going to make like a 4x6 of this, or I'm going to make a 5x7. I don't need a 4000 DPI scan, or even, you know, a 2700 DPI, or whatever the maximum that yours is. A 4000 DPI scan of a 35 millimeter slide can make a print that's like, 12 by 16 or something like that. It's really large print. And so people will say, well, I don't need a, I don't need a scan that size. Why don't I just make a smaller scan, makes a, makes a smaller file on my computer, it scans faster. The reason that I'm telling you not to do that is because inevitably, inevitably what will happen to you is you will scan a picture at a low resolution and then you'll decide, I'd like to make a bigger print of that. And then you realize, oh crap, I don't have enough resolution in my file. I gotta rescan the picture again. Which means not only rescanning the slide, it also means redoing any work that you did editing the picture afterwards. Um, it, it's a waste of time if you do that. You're better off scanning at the maximum resolution. You can always take the big file and make small prints with no problem. You cannot take a small file and make large prints, so the image quality will not be there. So scan at the maximum resolution your scanner offers. Um, next thing here, auto flip. Leave that off. Rotation, we'll come back to this after we do our pre-scan. Um, Auto skew and mirror should be off. Auto focus should be always. Auto scan at none. Auto save should be set to scan. And what this means is that when the scan is completed, view scan will automatically save the completed file to your computer. 
auto print should be at none. What this does is if you have it turned on, after the scan is completed, ViewScan will then send it to your printer to make a print of it. You don't want to do that. You never want to print the files that come out of the scanner directly because they almost always need some editing to make them look perfect. So there's, um, leave, that tur leave that turned off. Um, auto repeat should be none. Number of passes. This is an interesting thing for people who are scanning slide film. Um, this isn't something you would ever use if you were scanning either black and white or color negative film. It's only useful really for slide film. Um, and not all scanners offer this. So if you don't see this option in view scan with your scanner, it means your scanner doesn't, doesn't work with it. But if you see this option, I know most of the Nikon scanners can do it. And I think the Minolta's and Canon scan as well. Um, what this does is it, um, it scans each line of pixels more than once if you have, have multipass scanning turned on. And you can set how many times it does this. You can set one is one means the multipass scanning is turned off. It just scans everything once. But you can choose two or four or eight or whatever, however many you want to do. What that does is it, it, re, it reduces noise in very dark areas of the scan. And because slides have such a very high maximum density, that can be an issue. If you have a slide that has a lot of very dark areas, it's also a big issue if you have a slide that's underexposed that you want to try to fix that exposure problem after you scan it. You can scan an underexposed slide that's too dark, and then in Photoshop you can lighten it. Um, the problem is if you take an a underexposed slide like that and then you lighten it, you're going to find it's going to look really noisy because um, film scanners have a hard time with very dense slides. The multipass scanning reduces that tendency to get noisy on dark, on dark slides. Um, I'm not going to use it for this demonstration scan because the, the slide that I'm scanning today doesn't doesn't need it, but if you have a very dark slide that you're trying to scan and then correct for the exposure error, or if you have a scan, if you have a slide that's normally exposed but contains a lot of very dark areas, um, I would consider do it, using that. Um, just be aware that it does make the scan times longer. If you choose two passes, it doubles your scanning time. If you choose four passes, it quadruples your scanning time. Um, four usually works the best for me as far as a good compromise between getting maximum noise reduction without making the scan times horrifically long. Um, next thing here, multi-exposure and lock exposure. Leave multi-exposure off. Um, lock exposure is something that's useful. If you have several slides that were shot of the same subject in the same light at the same time, if you want all the scans to look identical to each other, click this before you do the first scan. And then every one of the scans, as long as you keep this click, will be done in a way that they look identical. Because the scanner has an auto exposure system built into it, just like a digital camera. It has to know how much exposure to give the sensor in the, in the scanner. And so it, it, looks at your, it looks at your film and then automatically decides how much exposure is needed, just like the auto exposure system in a digital camera. And sometimes, if you have more than one slide, even if they look identical, the, scan, the scanner's auto exposure system may, for some reason, decide to use a different exposure level for each one which will make it so that, the, so that the scans don't look alike. And that can be an issue for you. It's hard, it's hard to correct them in Photoshop to make them all look the same if they were scanned at different exposure levels. So that's what the lock exposure thing does. And I'm not going to use it here because I'm only doing one slide. Um, the analog gain things, uh, leave these alone. What these do is these are kind of like a way of manually changing the exposure for each of the color channels. And it doesn't really work all that well. And after you make a change, you don't see it instantly on the screen. You have to make the change and then do a new pre-scan. And if it's not right, make another change, do another pre-scan. It gets very time consuming, so I just leave these alone. Any corrections I need to do to exposure and stuff, it's so much easier to do it in photo editing software later, like Lightroom or Photoshop or whatever you like to use. Uh, next thing down here, default folder. This is, this is where the software is going to save your completed scan. So you need to click the little at sign here choose a location on your computer, and, and that's where your scans are going to be saved. Um, file name you can leave alone. Leave default options unchecked. Um, let's go ahead and do a preview scan now. You can hear the scanner starting to do its thing. It's got all the motors in there running to do the auto do the autofocus and all that, and then it'll start. Yeah, here's, here comes the scan. You can see it starting to appear on the screen. The preview scans happen pretty quickly, so this only takes a few seconds. Okay, 
Now, let's look at this rotation thing that I, that I mentioned earlier. I said that we had to wait until we did the pre-scan for this, and the reason why is that um, with my scanner that I'm using, see how I set the rotation to none, and now the picture is standing on its end? Um, you put the slides into the Nikon scanner I use um, vertically like this. Now, if you have a vertical picture, that's perfectly fine, but if you have a horizontal one, you're going to need to rotate it so that it looks normal, and that's what the rotation does. You can do it. You can rotate it to the right, which would be clockwise, which was wrong for this one because it made it upside down. Or you can rotate it to the left, and that gives us a normal look. So, and if you put the if you put a uh, if you put a vertical one in upside down, then you can use the flip option to correct that. So now that we've got this. Let's go over to the crop tab. I leave the setup manual, and I don't mess with any of these controls. The cropping you can do visually. You see, there's a crop box now around our pre-scan. All you have to do is just grab the sides and move them to set the cropping. And what I'm trying to do here is avoid getting any of this black border on while trying to maintain the maximum amount of actual image area in it. Um, one more thing that you see in here is there's this little circle with like crosshairs in the middle of it that you see. That's the focus point. Now, not all scanners offer this, but my Nikon scanner lets you choose where in the image you want it to focus. The autofocus system in the scanner works just like the autofocus system in a camera. It looks at actual detail in the image and tries to focus on that. And so if you have the focus point set to something that doesn't have any detail that it can lock onto, like, say, a, a flat colored wall with no detail, you're going to have the same problem with a scanner that you have with a camera when you try to focus on something like that. It's going to not be able to focus, and you're going to get an auto, you, you may get an out-of-focus picture. And so it's important to choose a focus point that has fine detail that the scanner's autofocus system can latch onto. Um, so you see here we've got like the, uh, the, the broom here, the bristles in it have lots of good detail, um, or this broom over here, um, maybe even the, the carpet under here. You wouldn't want to try to focus on the chair because it's real flat, doesn't have any detail on it. The wall behind is kind of too flat, really, for that, too. So what I'm going to do is just focus on this part of the broom here. Because you want to try to find something that's fairly close to the center of the picture to focus on. If you were to focus on something that was very close to the edges of the corner, like maybe down here, um, if the slide is not perfectly flat, and a lot of times the film in a slide holder is not 100% perfectly flat, focusing on something that's down here at the edge can result in the center of the picture being out of focus. Now focusing on something that's in the center with such a slide could cause the corners to be a little out of focus, but it's better to have them being soft than just have the center of the picture being soft. So this is what I'm going to choose here. Um, now we're going to go over to the filter tab. The first thing here is infrared cleaning, and what this does is it removes dust and scratches from the film. Now you should always um, take good care of your slides and make sure they don't get scratched, and you should, you should make sure that you clean them carefully before you put them in the scanner. Um, blow off any dust on them. If there's fingerprints, there's film cleaning solutions you can buy that you can use to remove fingerprints. Make sure that the picture is as clean as possible. But even then, you'll find that there's, al there's always going to be at least one dust spot that, that manages to survive your cleaning efforts and shows up on your scan. You can remove those in Photoshop or Lightroom or, or whatever image editing software you like, but using the infrared cleaning reduces the amount of work you have to do on that. And the infrared cleaning has different settings. None turns it off. Um, light, medium, and heavy. Um, I always scan my slides with the light setting unless the slide is real badly damaged or really dirty with dirt that can't be wiped off, like it's got embedded dust in the emulsion. The reason I'm choosing the light one for most things is because the higher settings, the medium and the heavy settings, actually reduce image sharpness a little bit. That's a trade-off that's worth it if you have a really heavily damaged slide, because having a heavily damaged slide, that you're losing a little bit of image sharpness if you're able to get rid of all those dust and scratches is, is a trade-off that could be worth it, but you don't want to lose image quality on a slide that's in good condition like this one is, and so I leave it on the light setting. Restore colors and restore fading are for, if you're scanning old slides that have faded or color shifted, these help to correct for that. Um, I'm not going to use them here because this slide is in good condition. Um, grain reduction, I would not recommend using. 
Uh, it reduces image sharpness quite a bit. Basically, it works just by blurring the, the by blurring fine details to make the grain disappear. It looks ugly. You don't want to do that. Um, sharpening, I also leave turned off, and the reason is because the sharpening that's built into software like ViewScan is pretty primitive compared to what's built into image editing software like Photoshop or Capture One or Lightroom or whatever. Um, you're better off doing your sharpening after you do the scan using your image editing software. And you need to be careful too with sharpening film scans because if you sharpen a film scan, um, it emphasizes the grain. So if you sharpen it too much, you can turn a good image into one that's very grainy and ugly looking. So I always take care of that later on when I'm editing the image. Um, the color tab here. You have color balance settings here and there's a bunch of different choices. Um, if you look through them, you can see that it changes the color of the image quite a bit from each one. Now, interestingly, I have another slide that I scanned while I was preparing to do this tutorial where, the, where pretty much every one of these settings looked the same on that slide. And that may be because that slide didn't have a lot of white area in it like this one does. But this one here, we're seeing pretty dramatic differences. Um, the neutral setting looks a little bit too warm, too yellow, but that's what the actual slide looked like because it was shot on a late, on an early evening with real warm end of the day, you know, golden hour sort of sunlight. And so I want to preserve that look that was there in the original slide. I don't want to color correct that out. If I choose the white balance setting, you see that the white balance is more normal. The, the white building now looks more neutral. Um, but I don't like that for this slide, so I'm going to choose the neutral setting, and that gives me one that's more more true to life to what the slide looked like. Now, your your pictures are going to vary. You'd want to choose whichever one looks best for the ones you're going to scan. Um, going down here, then black point and white point, leave these at zero. I think the default for the white point is one or two. Change it to zero if it's not already set to that. Same with the black, change it to zero if it's not already set to that. The reason is by setting these to higher numbers, it causes some clipping of the very white, very light and very dark tones. And it can cause white areas to end up having no detail on them or dark areas having no detail on them. By setting these to zero, you get a scan that's a little bit lower in contrast. But that's okay. Even if it's too low in contrast, you can always fix it later in your image editing software. You're better off having a scan that has all the information in the, in the slide captured in it with nothing lost and then doing any other corrections later if you need to, rather than having one where it's clipped some of the light and dark tones because there's no way you can bring those back by editing the slide later or by editing the file later. So set those to zero. Curve low and curve high, I just leave with the default settings. These let you adjust contrast, but it's kind of a primitive system for doing it. It doesn't, it doesn't work real well or very easily. This is so much faster and easier to do if you have proper image editing software. Open the file in Photoshop or, or Lightroom or whatever software you like to use. Do your contrast corrections there. It's a lot easier. You have a lot more, a lot more fine control over it. The brightness settings here, um, I leave these alone as well. This is something that, just like the curve settings, is much easier to, to set in image editing software than it is to do in scanning software. So I just leave them alone. Um, slide type. Now, you have choices here. You can choose generic color slide, and this is what I recommend for most slides. Um, the one exception to that is, um, you see there's only two choices for vendors, either generic or Kodak. So there's no choices here at all for Fujifilm or Agfafilm or any other, any other brand of slide you might have. If you choose Kodak, then you see you have choices here for either Ektachrome or Kodachrome or a couple of other Kodak films that haven't been made in decades. Um, I found, this is an Ektachrome slide, the one that I'm scanning here for a demonstration. I found no difference in the appearance scanning this as an Ektachrome or scanning it as a generic color slide. Um, I think that the real benefit to choosing the Kodak name and then a slide type would be if you're scanning Kodachrome. And Kodachrome is a very difficult film to scan. It tends to scan and looking very blue. And so choosing the Kodachrome setting I think can give you better quality with Kodachrome slides. If you're scanning Ektachrome, or if you're scanning Fuji or any other brand, I think that most of the time you're better off just choosing the generic color slide setting, like I've got here. 
Um, color scanning, or scanner color space, leave it default. Printer color space, does not matter what you have that set at because we're not printing out a view scan. Film color space, leave it default. Um, ITA outline, leave that alone too. That is for calibrating your scanner using an IT8 file, which is a, an IT8 is a color slide that has a bunch of uh, standardized colored squares on it that the scanner scans and then uses to calibrate itself. Um, that's beyond the scope of what we're doing here, and it's not really necessary. Um, I've never bothered doing that with any scanner I've owned, and, and it's, it's not really necessary for, for what most photographers are doing. Um, output color space. Um, this is going to be the color space that your, slide, that your scan is going to be set to. Um, I recommend choosing Adobe RGB for this one. It's a big, it's a big wide, fairly wide color gamut that captures just about everything that's going to be in most slides. But it's not such a wide one that, that it's hard to edit. There are other choices here you can choose. Um, wide gamut and Profoto RGB are both larger color gamuts, but they're hard to edit because there are no screens made today that, that show the full color gamut of those, and there are no printers made today that can print those colors that are in there. Adobe RGB is supported by a lot of screens and a lot of printers made today, and so that's what I standardize on. Um, sRGB is used for stuff on the web because um, a lot of the inexpensive monitors that ordinary people use for not photographers are basically sRGB monitors. I would not scan stuff in sRGB though because you're throwing away a lot of color, a lot of uh, color range that is present in the slide that would be outside the gamut of an sRGB picture. Um, if you need a picture to be in, in sRGB to put online, um, take the file and open it in Photoshop and, and make a copy converted to sRGB. I would recommend sticking with Adobe RGB for your output color space. Um, the monitor ICC profile, most modern image editing software like Photoshop and Capture One and Lightroom and all those, um, they're able to communicate with your computer's operating system, and this is true whether it's Windows or Mac, and find out what your, what your computer screen's uh, profile is. And this applies if your screen is, is calibrated and profiled. If, you, if you've got um, one of the i1 or spider devices that are used to calibrate screens, it'll produce an ICC profile for your screen every time you calibrate it. So you would want to look on, um, on your computer by clicking the at sign here and find that profile on your computer and manually set it in ViewScan um, if, your scan, if your screen is profiled. If your screen is not calibrated and profiled, you need to go buy one of those devices and and calibrate your screen because it really is vitally important. If you edit pictures on an uncalibrated screen, you're really just guessing on what they're going to look like because when you make prints, they're, they're probably not going to look anything like what you saw on the screen if the screen was not calibrated. And so you're really wasting your time doing any photo editing on an uncalibrated screen. Um, I do my work actually on an NEC, um, an NEC Spectra View screen, which is one that's actually specially made for graphics work and is self calibrating. It's a pretty high-end screen, and if you can afford something like that, I def I highly recommend it. There's a, it's so much easier to work with a screen that was made that was made for dedicated graphics work. But if you if you can't if you can't spend the money, something like this costs. This was like a twelve hundred dollar screen. Um, even having a cheaper screen will work better if you calibrate it with one of those calibration devices. Okay, moving on here. View color, leave to, at RGB, and leave these last two things unchecked. Um, go to the output tab. The default folder thing here where you chose where the scans are going to be saved is duplicated here from the input tab. So remember, we already set that down here. Um, I don't know why they felt the need to put that in two different places. If you've already set it in the input tab, you will find that, that the setting has carried over to the output tab, so you do not need to set it again. Um, you need to choose a file type, which um, for pictures you would choose either TIFFs or JPEGs. PDF is for scanning documents like on a flatbed scanner, so you wouldn't want to use that for Photoshop or for photographs, I mean. Um, I recommend using TIFFs, not JPEGs, and the reason is because a JPEG file has a lot of heavy compression applied to it to make the file size smaller. If you do very much editing to the file, it will quickly fall apart with color banding and blocky um, artifacts that don't look good. Um, so you should always scan as a TIFF file. If you need a JPEG later for something else, like putting on a website or whatever, you can always open the TIFF file and then save a copy of it as a JPEG in your photo editing software later. But you don't want to scan it as a JPEG, scan it as a TIFF. Um, 
the TIF settings up here, um, leave the size reduction set at zero. Multi-page should be set to off. That's only for documents. Um, file type, again, should be 48-bit RGB. We already set that in the input tab, but you need to set it again here. That setting does not carry over from the input tab. And if you have the input tab version and the output tab version set to different things, your, your scan is not going to look good. So make sure you set that to 48-bit RGB. Um, compression should be turned to off. TIFF profile should be checked. Printed size should be scan size, magnification 100%. Um, these things here let you type in information that gets saved in the files metadata. I don't mess with these in ViewScan because it's a lot easier to do this in Lightroom or Photoshop, which both offer um, those in Capture One too, and, and most other image editing software has places where you can enter in metadata. And the image editing software like that has a lot more, a lot more metadata fields you can put in, a lot more flexibility. So I prefer to just do that in my image editing software and not do it in the scanner software. Um, this other stuff down here you can leave alone. The preferences, uh, the preferences tab, I don't mess with any of this stuff. I just leave it all at the default. So once we've done that, we can go back to the input tab. We've already got our everything set up here that we want now. We've got the color set right. We've got the cropping set right. We've got the focus point set. Let's click scan. After the scanner finishes doing its autofocusing and setting up, which you can hear the motor running now, it'll start doing the actual scan. Yeah, here we go. Now this takes a couple minutes to complete, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna waste time in the video making you sit here and watch this appear. So we'll go ahead and skip on to Photoshop where I've opened the completed file so that we can edit it. Okay, now here's our completed scan open to Photoshop. Um, just to show as an example, because I mentioned that there was no difference in the appearance of one that was scanned as an image or one that was scanned as slide film in the input tab. This one here was shot when it was it set as a, as as an image, and this was done with it set as slide film. And you can see there's absolutely no difference between the two of them. And I still recommend the slide film setting because it gives you more controls in the in the color tab of view scan. Now this looks really really good. Um, one thing that's really nice about scanning color slides is that they don't need a lot of editing to make them look good. If you saw my black and white negative scanning tutorial or my color negative scanning tutorial, those needed extensive editing to make the pictures look good because um, negatives always scan in very very flat and low in contrast. So you have to do a lot of con contrast increase to make them look good. And color negatives always scan in with terrible color and they have to have the color balance adjusted in Photoshop too. This slide here actually looks pretty pretty dang good the way it is. I don't think I would change anything on it. Um, somehow, with some slides you may want to do a little bit of color correction if the uh, if the slide if the slide itself wasn't didn't have perfect color balance or if the scan's a little little slightly off, which it sometimes can be. Um, I don't think I would do anything about the contrast or the brightness of it. Um, the color looks good. I think. It does look it does look very warm, kind of yellowish, but that's what the original slide looked like because, like I said earlier, that's the kind of light that it was shot under. So this one I think I would leave alone. But um, if you need to do any any editing, you can always you know open the file in in whatever image editing software you like, Photoshop or Lightroom or whatever, and adjust the contrast and color using the the tools that the software offers. Um, here's another slide that I scanned when I was doing my preparations for this too. Um, this one here, uh, this is one I would probably edit a little bit because I think it's a little bit too light. Like some of this stuff here, I think it could be a little bit darker. So I think that this one here is an example when we can edit. Um, I'm going to do a curves adjustment layer. The reason for doing the curves on an adjustment layer is that adjustment layers don't affect the original image. It's like non-destructive editing. So if you make a, if you do any kind of editing. On adjustment layers, you can decide later that you don't like how it looked, and you can just um, delete the layer, and it's undone. So the original image has never actually changed. Um, and you can stack more, more than one layer on top of each other if you have to do multiple edits, and you can you can remove one or, or all of them if you change your mind later and decide you don't like them without without having ever made any changes to the to the original image. Now this one here, I, th I think I'll darken it down a little bit. Yeah, I think that looks better. This, th this back here, um, 
looked pretty dark in the original slide. I think the scanner's auto for the auto exposure tried to lighten it up a bit, and it ended up making this a little too light. So I think this looks a little bit a little bit more true to life. Because the original scene was like this too. This was deeply shadowed when I shot this this area here on the back of the building. It's an old chicken coop. Might even yeah. See, I'm I'm pulling down the highlights here in the in the in the curves, and that kind of brings these whites down a little bit so that they're not so blown out looking. And it slightly opens up the shadows a little bit. If you if you're not familiar with doing curves, I have a I have a written tutorial and a video tutorial on curves on my website, CrawfordPhotoSchool.com, and on YouTube. And I also have um, a tutorial on how, on how adjustment layers work that you can look at as well. So, yeah, I think this one looks fine the way it is with this little bit of editing. Um, the color might be a little bit, a little bit off, too. It looks like it's... This was shot with real warm lighting almost like what the what the chairs were. This was actually the same location. This was next to the house where the chairs were. Let's, uh, let's do another adjustment here and kind of warm it up a little bit. Yeah, no, I think that looks really good. So yeah, I think that was perfect. This was an example one that needed a little bit of editing. Um, sometimes you'll get one like the chairs that come out pretty much perfect. Sometimes you'll have to do a little editing, but with slides, you're never going to have to do anything really extensive. The the editing that I did on this one was like was nothing compared to the to the really extreme increases in contrast and and big changes in color balance I had to do in my color negative scanning tutorial because color negatives just need that much work to make them look good. Um, so if if you're shooting film with the intention of scanning it, shooting slide film is a lot easier for scanning than shooting color negative film is. Negative film has the advantage of having a lot more color, a lot more exposure latitude and being available in a lot more film speeds because the only color slide film you can buy now is 100 speed. But um, if you can deal with that limitation, slide film is a lot easier to scan.